this week on Warriors and Company. I told the Campbell Soup executives, I told the Heinz executives, I told the Dean Foods executives, I told the Mount Olive executive, the CEO, and I'm telling Reynolds America right now, you're a good man, but the system that you operate is wrong and is built on inequity, and you need to fix it because you have the power to do so. And there are bad people in the world, but the presence of firearms makes an encounter with a bad person even more dangerous. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, independent production fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation. The HKH Foundation. Barbara G. Fleischman and by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Welcome. My generation was moved and shocked by one of the most powerful documentaries ever made. Broadcast the night after Thanksgiving in 1960, Edward R. Murrow's Harvest of Shame exposed us to the callous exploitation of the migrant workers who pick our fruit and vegetables. This is an American story that begins in Florida and ends in New Jersey and New York State with the harvest. It is a 1960 Grapes of Wrath that begins at the Mexican border in California and ends in Oregon and Washington. It is the story of men and women and children who work 136 days of the year and average $900 a year. They travel in buses. They ride trucks. They follow the sun. They are the migrants, workers in the sweatshops of the soil, the harvest of shame. Believe it or not, more than 50 years later, the life of a migrant laborer is still an ordeal. And not just for adults, Perhaps as many as half a million children, some as young as seven years old, are out in the fields and orchards working nine to ten hours a day under brutal conditions. A few decades ago, Baltimore Velasquez was one of those kids, working in the fields beside his parents, who eventually migrated to Ohio, where he still lives. His experience led him to a life organizing and fighting for social justice for workers, still trapped, in his words, by their own fate and historical design. Following in the footsteps of the legendary Cesar Chavez and his United Farm Workers, Velasquez founded the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, or FLOC, and slowly built a movement, taking on some of the biggest corporate giants in America. In 1978, he led more than 2,000 workers in Ohio and Michigan on strike against vegetable growers and the Campbell Soup Company. The walkout and accompanying boycott were the largest agricultural labor action in the history of the Midwest. Eight years later, Campbell's and the growers agreed to a deal, the first farm labor contract outside of California. These days, Baltimore Velasquez and Flock are targeting R.J. Reynolds, the largest tobacco company in North Carolina and the second biggest in America. Earlier this month, Velasquez joined protesters at the weekly Moral Monday rallies outside North Carolina's capital in Raleigh demonstrating against draconian budget cuts and union busting. But this rich manufacturer from Toledo was calling me about uh, my organizing the migrant works in Ohio. He says, I want to talk to you about why you oppose me. So he invites me to his country club. And so I go to this country club and I say, are you a member of this country club? Why are you a member of this country club? He said, because this is where I do my networking, this is where I gather with people like myself to overcome the obstacles of doing my business. Yeah, and I bet you remember the Chamber of Commerce too, right? Yeah, for the same reason. 
Yeah, he said, well, you're a member of the Kiwanis Club for the same reason. Yeah, you're a member of the Rotary Club for the same reason. He says, yeah. What's well, so how come you white guys can have all the unions and us Mexicans can't have one? He was briefly arrested and surrendered peacefully, all part of the gospel, according to Baltimore Velasquez. Quote, speak truth to power with love in your heart. Pray for courage to speak it despite your fears. Explain the inequity and show your enemy the road to reconciliation. Baltimore Velasquez is with me now. It's good to meet you. Thank you. What was that like when you were a boy growing up? Your parents were working in the field. You were working in the field. What was your day like? Well, uh, pretty much like farm workers have now, that they get up at uh, daybreak and you have to work hard and fast because uh, and when I was young, m many of the crops were piece rate. There was no such piece thing. Piece rate meaning? You get paid per container or even by the acre. If you didn't work and fill those buckets or whatever, you didn't get paid and you didn't have anything to eat. So you're primarily just trying to make enough just to eat and maybe have some money to buy clothes and you try to make it uh, you know, follow the next crop or you hopefully it'll go better. Uh, just the other day we were joking about uh, my brother Jose and I, even my younger brother. I, sometimes there was such a sparse uh, food in the house that uh, we would actually count the beans on our plate to make sure we had the equal number of beans. <laughs> if there was an odd bean, we'd cut it in half. <laughs> <laughs> what did it do to your parents that they couldn't provide for all of you. That was one of the most uh, traumatic things in growing up. Uh, you see, being poor is in and of itself uh, uh, not traumatic. Uh, it's an inconvenience. But uh, being uh, poor and powerless uh, to withstand the mistreatment, to watch my mom and dad uh, be mistreated and are being fooled about the wages uh, and, and exact, exactly stolen from us. How, how so? <clears throat> well, it, if when you're working peace rate, like my dad didn't know very much English. And um, he would um, we were, say we were hoeing sugar beets and that we were getting paid by the acre. And my dad would always ask, well, how many rows are in an acre? So they'd tell him whatever many rows. And um, by this time, I was already in junior high school and I was learning math. I was always good in math cause, because when there's a little kid, you're picking by piece rate, you're counting all the time. So I knew numbers pretty good. And so I said, well, I learned the, the, to how many square feet there were in an acre and what the length and the width would be. And um, uh, so I just, one day I just got down on my knees and with a foot ruler and, and measured off the length of a field and work backwards and figure out what the width would be and then measured out the width with that ruler and figured and then counted the rows in that width and they find out that every for every acre we hoed we were two or three rows uh, more than what the acre actually was so when you hoe a, a uh, 40 acre field you're uh, you're only getting paid for 33 or 34 acres. And that's the way they cheated us. And I would tell my dad, they're cheating us, dad. You know, that's not how many rows are in an acre. This is the correct number. Well, what could you do about it, given that they were in charge? Nothing. That's the problem. There was no way for us to complain, no way for us to appeal to anyone. And if we wanted to go to local law enforcement, well, the farmers were all related to the uh, to the law enforcement, some of them were <laughs> family in the law enforcement, whether they're the judges or the uh, police or, or the sheriff of the county, and it made it not to our advantage to complain, because then you would be blacklisted from other farmers and nobody would hire you, and then we couldn't work and we wouldn't have anything to eat. Were your parents subjected to humiliation, the racial humiliation, the racial s snubs and epithets? Well, the verbal mistreatment of my mom and, uh, was something that was very, was very hard to take. A young man wants to defend his mom. And, and, and you're, you love your mom and you love your dad and, and you don't want to see them treated with disrespect and uh, less than a human being. And when you watch your parents being treated that way, it, it makes you angry, it makes you want to do something, it makes you want to fight. And at some point when I got to be about 12 or 13 years old, I, I decided that if I, when I grow up, if I can do something about this, I'm going to do it. 
that young? Well, I started thinking about it at that time, but uh, I felt kind of like, how in the heck do you go around, you know, uh, changing these things? It's, it seems so overwhelming, and uh, the parties, uh, not only the farmers we thought were, were big, but the, when you look at the corporations who bought the crops, the manufacturers, and now the retailers who are directly buying from many uh, large farms, it seems so overwhelming and like uh, so powerful. And um, you, ha you almost have to decide that if you fight these people, uh, it's kind of like suicidal. They're gonna blacklist you in the work, they're gonna discredit you in the community, they're gonna do everything they can to make you a pariah of society. And, and uh, I think that um, at some point, you make that decision, said, okay, if they want to do that, okay, but that's not going to keep me shut up. What did you do? Well, I, I went to college, and I got through my first year, uh, two semesters, for $800, out-of-state tuition, living with my grandparents, and um, I borrowed half of that money from a local bank in Ohio and um, had to work the following summer to work that off, but... Um, Doing what? Picking cherries uh, up in Michigan, but... Um, it was my experience in South Texas, the way to, to watch my grandparents, the way they were treated, and my aunts. Uh, the way, uh, I mean, didn't make any sense. This was 1965, and 80% um, uh, of the population are Mexican American. And every judge, every mayor, every county commissioner, everybody, they were all white. I said, now how's this? And um, uh, you watch the, the condescension. Well, that's the way my grandparents were treated. That's the way my aunts were treated. And uh, that was in the heyday of the civil rights movement. Uh, the folk singers were uh, singing protest songs. I, I learned and gleaned everything that I was hearing. And uh, so I went to uh, volunteer for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality in Cleveland, Ohio. And I lived in a tenement house with a uh, uh, an African-American family, and my job was to ride shotgun with another uh, man uh, with a police scanner in the car, and our job was to respond to police calls and uh, document police brutality cases in the, in the, uh, in the uh, black neighborhoods. Well, um, I'd go home every night to that tenement house, and I'd sleep on this guy's couch. Well, one morning he asked me, uh, son, I gotta ask you a question. I said, yeah, go ahead. He says, uh, well, um, uh, you're the only person I've ever had here as a volunteer that hasn't complained about the rats. Why is that? So I told him my rat story that I grew up with the rats in labor camps and the old farmhouse. We lived on a county line in northwest Ohio. There was uh, the, the couch that uh, in the living room was my bed and my brother's bed. He slept on one end and I slept on the other end. And... Um, there was uh, that couch was uh, pushed up against a window overlooking the front porch and there was a crack underneath the pane and that's where the rats would come in at night. So at night you'd hear the scratching along the back of that couch and we knew there was a rat going to get up on the top up there and we knew that the rat had to jump on the seat where we were sleeping before it got on the floor. So when we'd hear the uh, the, uh, the scratching on the back of that couch, we'd kick each other and pull the blanket taut and, um, to make kind of like a trampoline for the rat. And the rat would jump down on the, on the blanket, and when we'd hear that, we'd go with our fists underneath, boom, like that, to see how far we could make the rat fly. And that was our game, to see how far we could make the rat fly. But um, the, the man says, <laughs> he looked kind of stunned, and he said, he said, good Lord, son, why aren't you doing something for your own people? And that's what... Uh, provoked the thought, I thought, I need to go back and start organizing the migrant workers and try to follow the lessons of the civil rights movement uh, to uh, speak for people and organize them so they can speak for themselves. You make me think of a video that I saw the other day of a speech you made after one of your colleagues in Flock had been murdered in uh, Mexico. Let me play that video for our audience. I'm talking to you now as organizers. Look. We're not doing this because the objective, Billy, uh, uh, catch me carefully here. The objective is not to win. That's not the objective. The objective is to do the right and good thing. 
See, because if you, if, you, if you decide not to do anything because it's too hard, it's too impossible, well, then nothing would be done. And when you die, when you're on your deathbed, you know what? You're going you're gonna to say to yourself, I wish I would have tried to do something. So if you go and do the right and good thing now, and if you do it long enough, good things will happen. How did you come to that strategy? I figured that, well, we can just lay down and just let matters uh, overwhelm us and take us in and, and uh, whine and complain about how bad things are or get up and do something and start speaking to those things that are upon you and those things that are evil and uh, the misdeeds upon you and just do it and don't stop and whatever happens, happens. But it's better, uh, as Emiliano Zapata said, um, it's better to die on your feet than to, uh, uh, than to live on your knees. And your parents understood that? My mom was, the, was a strong one. She was a, a charismatic Catholic. She would say, only God knows, and in Spanish, you know, and uh, whatever the Lord decides, and how can we have a God, you know, that, that keep us in this situation? And I was always angry about it. I would be very puzzled that my mom would, uh, would have that kind of faith um, in, in, uh, in light of uh, our reality that we had at that time. How did you reconcile the reality that you were dealing with and the faith your mother was expressing in a benevolent and good God? Well, I didn't hear an audible uh, word from God, but it came to me that if he would speak words, it would come out like this. Look, uh, had you not gone through all those trials and all those problems, I would not now have a spokesperson to speak for the people. And now I can take that experience and try to verbalize it and try to explain it to the world so that other people who are in that situation can have uh, uh, some visibility uh, in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of the public, the lawmakers, other people. They need to have a voice. And uh, I can't speak for all of them, but I can help open the door and organize them so they can speak for themselves. And uh, so that's the way it was reconciled. And more importantly, I think that um, the anger issue, uh, which I any young man's gonna have growing up in that situation, it's not just, um, uh, it's just not um, uh, the issue of getting even anymore. But it was at one time, wasn't it? It you, was. You felt I was gonna get even with these? Yes, right, these guys who taken advantage of us. Um, but when you come to know the Lord, uh, you begin to understand that what true reconciliation is, and true reconciliation is tough because uh, if you're angry and just want to fight, uh, there's a winner and there's a loser. But when there's true reconciliation, it's uh, you bring the harmony of the opposition uh, into some way in which you can live in this world together because that's really what we are trying to do. and uh, This is really what we want. I've read that you've even said we need to love these businessmen. Well, in Scripture, there's a principle about uh, hating the sin and loving the sinner. Uh, and a person can be uh, running a corporation. And I, I say this to them. I told the Campbell Soup executives. I told the Heinz executives. I told the Dean Foods executives. I told the Mount Olive executive, the CEO. And I'm telling Reynolds America right now, you're a good man, but the system that you operate is wrong and is built on inequity and you need to fix it because you have the power to do so. And uh, keep telling them and find ways to get their attention until they do something about it. And how do you get their attention? We campaign, we boycott, we protest, we march, we go in front of uh, retail stores and, and organize the consumers who are our best ally. The uh, consumer. The consumer because there's the growing conscience in this country for safe food, good food, uh, produce under just conditions, uh, uh, treating their labor and the environment correctly. And uh, uh, thank God for, for uh, the consumers who, who are conscious about those things for their own sake and for their family's sake. That's a huge power there in the public among the people. We can tell the retail stores, tell, you, you gotta tell uh, uh, Reynolds America to uh, negotiate an agreement with Flock to guarantee the rights of workers at the bottom of their supply chain. They can do that, they can fix that. They have the power to do that. What is the issue right now with R.J. Reynolds? How long has this campaign been going on? 
been going on almost five years. Five years. Yeah. So. What's the issue? Uh, the issue is that the uh, the inequality that they've designed in their supply chain, when they do the pricing of the tobacco, it really amounts to economic marginalization of the small family farmer. So if the family farmer is marginally uh, is financially marginalized, uh, the farm worker is going to be in a terrible situation trying to be employed by that farmer, by that supplier. So um, uh, it's, like, it's like one of us throwing a bone at two dogs and let them fight over uh, who's going to get the better of it. And uh, that's really the fight between farmers and migrant farm workers in this country today. And it's a wrong fight. It shouldn't be happening. The farmers and the farm workers should be talking to this, the, the retail uh, people, uh, big corporations and the manufacturers about just pricing in the industry so there could be some equity for those people to be able to make a living and to be able to feed, educate, and close their families. And yet, R.J. Reynolds refused for years to meet with you, didn't they? Yes, they have. What did they say? They said, we don't, we're not the employers. Same they said thing. the employers are down there, yeah, the small farmers. Right. But um, I've just put a proposal down to them in writing and I'm asking them to do three things. One, uh, stop relying on human trafficking for your labor supply. Number two, end the squalor in the labor camps because you can't talk about health and safety without talking about sanitary facilities where they're living, where they're housing these workers. For instance, in tobacco, one of the biggest threats to a worker's health is the nicotine uh, ingestion, nicotine poisoning of his body. And uh, you have to wash that off every night you have to uh, uh, wear a change of clothes every day, so you've got to have good washing facilities, good shower facilities. And three, you've got to end the state of fear of those workers being able to complain about matters, and many of them are uh, life-threatening uh, uh, issues, like, for instance, North Carolina, North Carolina leads the nation in heat stroke deaths. In what? Heat stroke. And many of them happen in agriculture. Uh, and workers can't be afraid to ask for water. Uh, and because it's terribly... You mean they can be afraid to ask for water now? They're afraid to take breaks. I went to work in a uh, tobacco farm uh, about three summers ago now, figuring if I'm going to represent tobacco workers, I, I need to go out and do the work to see what they go through. So I moved into a labor camp and uh, worked a six-day work week. And um, believe me, the major things you fought was the heat, uh, the hydration issue, uh, and the nicotine ingestion. Uh, you had to wear clothing buttoned up to your neck, and uh, in the morning you wear plastic bags, trash bags made into ponchos, uh, so that uh, it keeps the wet leaves, the dew that's on the leaf, or rainwater that's on it. That water has nicotine in it, so when it gets on your body, you ingest it through the skin. A researcher just said that um, workers that handle tobacco that they ingest the equivalent of having smoking 22 cigarettes in a day. So um, you, you fight the, the nicotine ingestion and you fight the, the hydration. And it, Bill, it's impossible to keep hydrated because it's over 100 degrees, the humidity is high, and some of the, particularly the rows that are very long, when I walked down one in the one row and back before where the water supply was, uh, the farm I work at, great water supply, but by the time you went down there and back, it's, a, it's, it's two hours, and by that time you're soaked, uh, and with sweat, it, and it's, it's impossible to keep totally hydrated in the field, no matter how much water you drink. You don't get, a, I didn't get hydrated until I got back to the labor camp at night. Give me a sense, a brief picture of the R.J. Reynolds tobacco supply chain. How does it work? Well, the, the company contracts the tobacco from independent family farms. They're mostly fairly small, anywhere from a dozen to 20, 30 employees and uh, the size of the acreage uh, uh, is a lot smaller than the bigger operators. But the uh, uh, R.J. Reynolds contracts the, that, um, that tobacco directly with those farms, so they may have any number of farmers uh, contracted to them to grow the, the required tobacco that they need uh, produced in North Carolina. And um, that's a pretty direct contract. And then, of course, the farmers then, in turn, the hire either guest workers, uh, undocumented workers through the use of labor contractors and crew leaders. And a lot of times the crew leaders are the ones that have the economic relationship directly with the workers. So you've got the company, you've got the growers, 
and you might have a level of crew leaders, labor contractors, and then the workers. So all those parties have to come together at some table. And you represent the tobacco cutters, the guys the right down there in the... On the bottom. What do they make? Um, that depends. Uh, believe it or not, the guest workers make more than the undocumented people. Uh, uh, define the difference between a guest worker and an undocumented worker. The worker comes with a visa, an H-2A visa. Uh, and uh, the Department of Labor requires, uh, requires uh, those employers uh, to um, pay um, a prevailing wage. This year it's uh, 968 an hour. Uh, for Nine dollars and sixty-eight cents an hour in in North Carolina. If you have the visa. If you have the visa. If you don't have the visa. If you don't have the visa. Who knows? You're undocumented. You're undocumented. You you don't know. Particularly if you're working for a labor contractor, the um, they're only obligated to pay, you know, the minimum wage seven twenty-five an hour. We've seen cases where the farmer pays the crew leader seven twenty-five an hour for all the hours reported for his crew. And we've discovered that the crew leader takes a cut off of that. So they're really making under minimum wage uh, and, um, and sometimes even less. We've, we've, we've had cases which we tried to report to the Department of Labor and um, the local law enforcement agencies, um, workers held pretty much in captivity. Uh, we found a crew of 50 workers living in three house trailers. Only one had a working stove, two had only working toilets, and uh, many of them were sleeping on the floors like sardines, and, uh, and um, uh, three of them escaped and came to us for help. And workers are afraid to complain. They're afraid to come out and uh, file a complaint uh, because, because of retaliation. They'll be sent home or they'll be punished in some other way? Exactly. Uh, or the crew leader knows where their families live in Mexico. They're afraid for their families not only here, but they're afraid for their families in Mexico. And it's true. The, some of the H-2A workers, not in the people H2A, we... H-2A, that's... Uh, the guest workers from Mexico. We know of cases in other areas uh, that with other uh, labor contractors that uh, recruit workers in Mexico that don't, sure don't do things by the book. At one time, you were seeking what you call freedom visas, which simply granted workers the right to move across national borders the way corporations can do. Are you still an advocate of the freedom visa? Well... That was a response to the North American Free Trade Agreement. NAFTA, signed by President Clinton in 1993. Yeah, see, that, that is, uh, devastated the Mexican countryside, uh, just, just in the commodity of corn, um, it, which is a staple in Mexico. Everybody grows corn in Mexico. Uh, and um, they grow it for their local use, use for themselves. And then the access, they tried to sell it in the local market. Uh, so when NAFTA opened the borders to North American corn, those small corn farmers in Mexico couldn't help to compete with U.S. farmers. They're highly mechanized and highly subsidized. Uh, we have the, one of the largest uh, farm aid uh, programs in the world. So the Mexican farmers can't compete with subsidized U.S. farmers, and they take over the corn market in Mexico, uh, driving these people off their, off their land. Uh, the Carnegie Endowment issued a report on the commodity of corn and now are saying that uh, it's displaced two million corn farmers in Mexico. And we complain about these same guys coming over our border now. I say, well, if you want them to stop coming over, it'd be a good idea, but maybe we should stop displacing them so they wouldn't have to come here in the first place. And so I think it's important that, um, uh, that, uh, that if we're going to be talk about free trade and free markets, which both Republicans and Democrats are big advocates of, then we should talk about the labor market as a market also. And what drives markets? Law, supply, and demand. So if you're going to allow the, the, the labor to be a free market as well, you've got to allow labor to flow freely the way you do other commodities uh, under your uh, philosophical thinking. And, uh, and in order to do that, you've got to have a visa so that these workers can travel f uh, freely within the countries that signed these agreements that created this problem in the first place. But isn't that a market? Isn't labor a market? And shouldn't it be treated as a free market? And, and, and if it, uh, it would be allowed to fro flow freely like they want commodities to do, they ought to do the same and let the market saturate themselves. But the one caveat to that would be that it would, uh, the workers would be given their labor rights. They cannot restrict their labor rights, the, the freedom 
to be able to have association, to organize themselves, and that that be recognized. Because that is a very a fundamental American principle that we try to marginalize people by denying that right to a group of people. After your colleague, I think he was the manager of your office in Monterey, was killed back in, what, 2007, I could tell from the speeches I saw you delivering then, particularly that one to the, uh, that I showed earlier, that you were really angry. You said, our organization is a threat to the diabolic elixir of demagogues, oligarchies, <laughs> unfair trade, and financial services industry. I, mean, I think that's the truth. And um, uh, yes, um, I'm angry. Uh, you know, the, but you have to be careful when you're angry. You, the scripture tells us that <laughs> there is such a thing as righteous anger, but do not sin in your anger. Uh, and to hold those people accountable for the uh, decisions that make that uh, have the effect like that on other people. And uh, I'm afraid that this country uh, needs um, a shaking up in that regard. Uh, we, it's very difficult to, to see what's happening in our country today. Uh, what do you mean, what's happening? Well, the margin, marginalizing democracy. Uh, people to speak for themselves. I mean, isn't that why we fought the British crown? That we had a right to speak for ourselves and not have things imposed upon us without our representation? Uh, isn't that why we fought a, a civil rights movement? So that people could have a right to vote, to have to speak, to represent themselves? And... Um, uh, and now they're, they're, they're cutting those things off. When you say that your, your adversary is a diabolical system, uh, oligarchy and money and all of that, you're fighting back, you're outnumbered, but you keep fighting with a ragged army of marginal people? Well, that's better than fighting with nothing. And, and Cesar Chavez described it best in times that it's been a lot of, had a lot of discussion with Caesar. He says, um, you know, the rich have a lot to oppose us. They got a lot of money. I and mean, farm work, we farm workers, we don't have anything. In the back of my mind, I think of what anything becomes a powerful weapon. Because when you don't have anything, you don't have anything to lose. So what you're investing in the fight is nothing but time. And the opposition is investing money. And the way Caesar put it was, there's a lot more time than there is money, and money's going to run out before time. So as long as we don't give up, something's got to happen. So it doesn't take a whole lot to fight. Um, you just got to be willing to do it. And the problem with a lot of people is they don't want to do it because they think they're going to lose something. Uh, they, got too, they think they got too much to lose. Well, in that regard, you're already lost before you started. How long have you been doing this? Uh, since 1967. 45 years. Someone told me you don't even have a pension, that you don't have a retirement. Mm, no, I sure don't. How old are you now? 66. And you're not si showing any signs of slowing down or trying to figure out what you're going to do next? I thought about that at one time, and um, I, uh, a friend of mine uh, recently uh, passed away, uh, attorney, friend, uh, who had good money, he offered to uh, 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 fund a pension for me. I said, Jack, I can't, I can't do that because the farm workers don't have any. And if, if I got something and they didn't, they're going to say, well, it's nice of you to go out and talk about fighting the big corporations when, and you're all set in, in your life. So it doesn't, doesn't make it uh, much like you're sharing too much of the sacrifice with the people that are trying to organize. But... Um, uh, Literally, it comes down to, again, that, uh, that spiritual foundation that I got from my mom. Uh, Matthew 6, 26, uh, this is Jesus talking. Uh, he says, why, why do you worry about what you're going to eat uh, tomorrow? I said, look at the birds of the air. They know sow nor reap, nor they store their grains in barn. Yet my heavenly Father feeds them. How much more am I going to care for you? And look at the lilies of the field. If you're wondering about what you're going to wear tomorrow, the lilies of the field, uh, not even Solomon in all his splendor is dressed as one of these, uh, that you're going to be taken care of. And I, that's, that's, that's my pension right there. <laughs> Jesus also said, as you have quoted, love thy neighbor, 
turn the other cheek. But he also threw the money changers out of the temple. So I, I think you probably embraced well, both philosophies. Well, I, I remind people of that as well, and that sometimes you got to speak to the injustice. It's, it's the same thing as, as, uh, as Jesus speaking to the storm and calming the waters. Uh, and everybody's afraid of the storm and the waters around them. But he told his disciples, you know, oh, your little faith, you know, you speak to the mountain, it'll move. And so um, I think this is what we're doing, Bill. We're speaking to those mountains, those mountains of wealth and capital uh, that needs uh, to be humanized for them to use that uh, wealth and that capital for good things, for people to develop uh, our, our nation and make it strong. Because when you, when you, in this whole immigration reform, when you have 11 million people without papers uh, living in the shadows and you have exploited farm workers in the bottom, I think that makes our country weak. How can we go around the world and saying that we're the, uh, the bastion and the, the uh, uh, light of, of, of uh, freedom uh, throughout the world when we marginalize people within our own country and our own society? And as it says in scripture, a house divided uh, in itself cannot stand. And at some point it'll come back to hound us. It seems to me you've not only lost, listened to Jesus, You've also listened to Martin Luther King. You remember he said, when you impede the rich man's ability to make money, anything is negotiable. I think this has been one of the cornerstones of our thinking in every campaign we design. Um, um, it's the only time I ever uh, was uh, with Dr. King in that winter of 68, I believe, and when uh, I got an invitation to, to come to Atlanta and help plan the Poor People's Campaign. This is very early in my organizing career. And um, uh, I went to Atlanta and got to meet uh, some of the other Latino leaders and Indian leaders uh, that he brought in for the, uh, for the planning. And um, uh, I, being innocent, uh, <laughs> not knowing that history was before my very eyes, <laughs> so that afternoon when I was there, it was like three, 30 in the afternoon and Dr. King comes in with a, a column of um, uh, ministers uh, with uh, Ralph Abernathy on one side and Andy Young on the other side and a young Jesse Jackson in tow. <laughs> and uh, he was deciding in this Poor People's Campaign that the question of inequity in America was not just black, uh, that it was a class issue. It wasn't just a black issue. To us that was important. and. Uh, the discussion came to that uh, question about how do we as poor people, we're talking about organizing a poor people's campaign to take on the powers in Washington, the, the monolithic economic institutions of our country to bring equity to the poor people in this country. That how do we as poor people who have nothing, uh, who uh, don't have the money and the power and the politicians in our hip pocket compel the world's largest, uh, richest people to sit down and talk to us. And that was a response that, uh, that I remember that was so burned into my, into my brain that uh, uh, when you impede the rich man's ability to make money, anything is negotiable. And we have followed that principle in all the campaigns we've designed and we keep looking until we find it. Polomar Velasquez, thank you very much for being with me and thank you for the work you do. Thank you, Bill. It's been an honor being here. Baltimore Velasquez and R.J. Reynolds were to hold another negotiation this past week. It was postponed amidst rumors the company is lobbying the state's right-wing dominated legislature for protection against the union. Velasquez says Flock will fight on. They've never lost yet. Farm workers aren't the only ones being exploited. Virtually every low-wage earner in America is taking it in the neck. Walmart with revenues last year of nearly $470 billion, is threatening to abandon plans to build three giant stores in Washington, D.C. Why? Because the city council insists they pay a living wage of $12.50 an hour. Now, keep in mind that if adjusted for productivity, the federal minimum wage should be almost twice that amount. But Walmart is in a tizzy over the Washington living wage demands, despite the heirs of founder Sam Walton already socking away almost $116 billion. You have to ask, how much is enough when no matter what you have is never enough? Which brings us to McDonald's. The fast food giant's new CEO, Don Thompson, 
was just awarded a pay package of nearly $14 million. Now, perhaps that helps explain why McDonald's has set up a website with Visa to show its full-time workers how to get by on the minimum wage it pays, which turns out to be a little over $1,100 a month. All you have to do, they say, is get a second job and not spend any money on food, presumably because you can live on the crumbs from Don Thompson's table. That's a lot of leftover chicken McNuggets. Clearly, the owners of capital are determined to wring even greater wealth from the sweat of workers, deepening our spin into economic inequality. Until and unless, in solidarity, those workers stand up like Baltimore Velasquez and demand a fair wage for a hard day's work. As the world knows, Trayvon Martin was stalked and shot to death by an armed vigilante. The police report that night called it an unnecessary killing to prevent unlawful act. We will never know the full story because the victim has been forever silenced. That's the thing about guns. They have the last word. Martin's killer, George Zimmerman, pleaded self-defense and was acquitted, thanks in part to Florida's Stand Your Ground Law. That law was the handiwork of the National Rifle Association, whose lobbyist, Marion Hammer, is seen standing there beside Governor Jeb Bush when he signed it in 2005. Ever since, members of the right-wing organization, the American Legislative Exchange Council, also known as ALEC, have been pushing versions of bills like it in state capitals across the country. 21 states have followed suit. To understand what's happening, read this important new book, the Last Gun, How Changes in the Gun Industry Are Killing Americans and What It Will Take to Stop It. The author is Tom Diaz. He's a veteran, former NRA member, and worked as an assistant managing editor at the conservative Washington Times. Trained as a lawyer, he served as a senior policy analyst at the Violence Policy Center before turning to full-time writing and speaking on guns and their impact on America. Tom Diaz, welcome. Thank you so much. I heard you say earlier that the real winners in the Florida tragedy are the NRA and the gun industry. How so? Well, for two reasons, I think. One, it in their eyes validates the whole concept of this, what they call stand your ground law. Look, um, Zimmerman stood his ground and nothing bad happened to him. So that validates the idea that you're going to need these things to protect yourself. Secondly, it increases the market, which is what ultimately this is all about. Now they have a case to say, don't you wish you had one of these things in your pocket if some guy was beating your head in the, in the sidewalk? So it, it re one hand reinforces the other. Now, the, the conservatives are claiming that stand your ground was not a factor in this case. The National Review online says the media is, quote, inventing reasons to blame the verdict on Florida's gun laws, when in fact, the stand your ground law wasn't even used in Zimmerman's defense. It wasn't used technically, that I would agree with, but the stand your ground law changed the circumstances in Florida uh, under which a person might go about armed, as did Zimmerman. And so that even if the lawyers, I think quite wisely, the defense lawyers chose not to make this an issue, um, it encouraged the kind of carrying of weapons and the thought that, well, I can use this. The law of self-defense, which goes back to ancient times, to right. the Talmud, it's absolutely clear that a person who's being threatened, whose own life is being threatened, has the right, the moral, ethical, legal right, to, if necessary, kill the person trying to kill them. That's not a question. What we did develop, though, in our common law were restraints about when you might use that. Um, one had a duty to retreat generally, avoid violence if you can. Why take another human life if there's a way out of the conflict? There was an exception to that, and that was in one's own home. This is the so-called castle doctrine. That's where the word, the phrase, stand your ground, came into the legal significance. If you're in your own home, and I come in and, and I'm clearly going to do you harm, you have no duty to retreat. If necessary, you can take my life. 
What's happened here is that the NRA, Marion Hammer and the people in Florida, and gun advocates generally have twisted this language so that now they've taken this concept of stand your ground into the public space. And they've tried to say, well, the law hasn't changed. In fact, the law has changed. It was very carefully crafted to reduce mayhem, to reduce the chance that somebody's going to be killed, and now turned into a situation that practically begs for someone to be killed if I feel threatened. Do you think this is what happened to George Zimmerman? Yes. I have to say, I don't think George Zimmerman is a victim. I think he was a tool. A tool? He was the perfect marketing target of the gun industry. Small handgun, carried around. If you're going to, t to, to buy, no pun intended, at Target, which is apparently his destination, don't you need your gun to protect yourself? This is exactly what the NRA and the gun industry want to do because it increases sales and there's a whole, within the industry themselves, they talk about how wonderful this concealed carry standard ground laws are for selling small handguns exactly like Zimmerman had. But there are dangerous people out there. They will tell you that. We have known there are dangerous people since medieval times. And we've understood there's a problem. And we've said you can defend yourself um, when necessary. That hasn't changed one bit. What has changed is the mix so that we now have people going around with more deadly weapons. It's something that I think that most average Americans simply have no understanding of the mindset of the diminishing number of people who own firearms and who own them specifically to carry out on the street. Nevertheless, they have a mindset. And that mindset is danger lurks everywhere and you better have your gun to protect yourself. Goes to, to the extreme of having, you need a gun in your bathroom because what if you're going to the bathroom and your gun is in the living room? You need a gun in your ankle because suppose you drop your gun that you carry in your waist. This is not an exaggeration. I read regularly the uh, fan magazines of the gun business. And it's, I, t I say it's like reading um, these bodice ripper romance novels without any good parts. The two things they talk about more than anything else are military style assault rifles and handguns for self-defense. Almost every issue of every magazine fuels this feeling that you better have a gun, and hey, here's the greatest new gun in, in, in the industry. You're saying this is a business strategy? Oh yeah, and the gun industry admits it. One of the prolific writers in the industry magazine, this is not fan magazines now, this is a magazine where the industry talks to itself, called it cashing in. And basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but the, the exact phrase in the book, he said, if you're not cashing in on concealed carry laws, you're not gonna make money article after article in the industry publication says these laws are going to boost your sales of handguns and specific kinds of handguns that are going to bring you out of the slump. And not only that, both in the case of assault rifles and handguns, one writer described the customer as a walking cluster, a walking cluster of aftermarket sales. You're going to need special holsters. Now they're even saying you're going to need a special coat for the winter or the summer to conceal your gun. So the aftermarket and accessories are where, and as a matter of fact, it's where, as in a lot of consumer products, it's where the big profits are. And what it appears to be is that it's not so many new buyers as it is old buyers buying more and more guns. The, the, the um, average number of guns owned by gun owners has gone up and up and up. The, the average number of households and individuals who say they own guns has been going down. So what we have is fewer and fewer people buying more and more guns. How do you reconcile what you've just said about fewer and fewer people actually owning guns with the increasing power of the National Rifle Association? You write in your book that the NRA has gone to extreme lengths to draw a veil of secrecy mm -hmm. over the facts, the facts surrounding its impact on our lives. Mm -hmm. Well, the gun industry learned a lot from the cigarette industry. When the cigarette industry was sued, one of the things, probably the most important thing that people who litigated against the cigarette industry was the internal papers of the cigarette industry where we found out these guys not only knew they were killing people, they went to lengths to cover up the fact that they were killing people. The gun industry was terrified when some litigators said, hey, why don't we do to the gun industry what we did to the cigarette industry and other 
evil industries. So they got Congress to pass a law to do away with lawsuits against. It's very hard to sue the gun industry. But there were two other corollaries that led up to that. One was preventing the Centers for Disease Control, yeah. which is our public health research arm, the source of almost all of our data about everything from measles to firearms death. They decided, and a congressman by the name of Jay Dickey said, hey, we don't want them doing this research on guns. He originally wanted to shut down the whole unit that does all research. And finally, they compromised and said, okay, you just can't spend any money on guns. So we have told the National Public Health Research Agency, you can look at anything else. You can look at measles. You can look at um, workplace accidents, but don't look at guns. So, so that's one. Number two, there's an agency, a law enforcement agency, a federal law enforcement agency called the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. I'll call it ATF. ATF does something called tracing crime guns, which means if a gun is used in a crime or is found at a crime scene or illegally possessed, they trace that gun from its manufacturer, because federal records are, the manufacturers are required to keep records, to the first point of its public sale, and then if they can, they follow it to the point at which it was either found or right. used in a crime. Um, the value of that in terms of law enforcement is law enforcement investigators can tell, was this gun used in another crime or crimes? Mm -hmm. How did this person get the gun? Was it possibly sold by gun traffickers? From a public health point of view, the value of this data, and we're talking about millions upon millions of cases investigated that is traced by ATF, is that we can answer some of the questions that now are just veiled. For example, when I worked in this field, people would call me up and say, well, how many Glock pistols were used in shootings in the last 10 years? And I would say, nobody knows. And we don't know. We could know if we could access the ATF database. The same thing when this horrible shooting uh, in Newtown. Um, people would say, well, how many of these Bushmaster AR-15 assault rifles have been used in shootings or crimes? We only know anecdotally, but if we could get that ATF data, we would know precisely. So it would answer questions about, do these designs make a difference? Are specific kinds of guns implicated in crime? So that's the ATF contribution. If you take those two together, public health, law enforcement, you would have a very good picture of what is the impact, not only of guns generally in the United States, but of specific types, calibers, manufacturers. The industry is terrified of this. So how, how is it they've kept Congress from giving us that basic information? Yeah. How do you explain the power of the industry over our political process? They own our political process now. Well, I think there are two answers to that, and it doesn't give me any joy to say it. One, the, one of the things the NRA has a program called Refuse to be a Victim. The American, certainly the American national, and I'll say liberal, progressive, whatever you want to say, political establishment has chosen to be a victim. They have given up on guns. They've bought into a thing called the third way, which is somehow there's this mythical common ground we can reach with the NRA or, or the gun industry. And let's not talk about gun control. It's just, they call it the third rail of power. So a, you have a victim here. On the other hand, it must be said that the National Rifle Association has what every politician wishes they had. That is, they have somebody in every congressional district, even if it's only one or two people, they have somebody. When Wayne LaPierre, in his palatial headquarters in Fairfax, Virginia, pushes the button, the talking points go out, the phones or the emails arrive in Congress, the other side is not that organized. People who are gun control advocates have typically been small groups in Los Angeles, Washington, New York. They can't respond to that. That I hope, I think, is changing. Tom, we're out of time right now, but let's continue this discussion online. Great, thank you. The book is The Last Gun, How Changes in the Gun Industry Are Killing Americans and What It Will Take to Stop It. Tom Diaz, thanks for joining me. My pleasure, thank you. Coming up on Moyers and Company, 50 years after the historic March on Washington, we go back to the scene 
with civil rights hero John Lewis, the youngest man to speak on that historic August day and the last of the speakers still living. That's next week on Mortgage and Company. I'll see you then. Don't wait a week to get more Moyers. Visit BillMoyers.com for exclusive blogs, essays, and video features. This episode of Moyers & Company is available on DVD for $19.95. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, Independent Production Fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Anne Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation. The HKH Foundation. Barbara G. Fleischman. And by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America. Designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company.